The Tom Woods Show, episode 613. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I'm hosting a cruise with Bob Murphy in October 2016. It's the Contra Cruise, and we are going to have a blast. We're going to have so much fun on this thing. 30% of the cabins are already sold out, and we've only been promoting it about a month. So don't miss it. Check it out at ContraCruise.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're talking climate change today. And we're talking with Chip Knappenberger, who is Assistant Director of the Center for the Study of Science at the Cato Institute. He has over 20 years of experience in climate research and public outreach, including 10 years with the Virginia State Climatology Office. He's published numerous papers in the major atmospheric science journals on global warming, hurricanes, precipitation changes, weather and mortality, and Greenland ice melt, among many other areas. He was also the administrator and a major contributor to World Climate Report, the original and longest-running blog on Earth on climate change. Chip, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thanks for uh, having me here. I solicited questions for you, and uh, these are questions that people who have to deal with climate arguments on Facebook all day, you know, want to know the the answer to. And in particular, well, but I think before actually, before I, I ask you those questions, let me have you explain. I don't want to assume what your views are on the the question of climate change. Tell me what your views are and how they're different from what we're told the mainstream view is. Okay, sure. Um, first of all. You, you hear the term climate change deniers kicked around, and, and folks want to sort of tar people with that. Um, but in fact, there are not many of those sort of people. And I'm not one of them. I would consider myself maybe a lukewarmer is what um, we've been calling ourselves. Um, human emissions of greenhouse gases um, affect the climate, and they affect the daily weather. Um, no doubt about that. Um, but I don't necessarily think that they are the um, an, an influence that's so strong that it drowns out all other influences. I, I think natural variability still plays a pretty large role, especially in um, the daily weather events and the local weather events that we all really interact with the climate and interact with the weather through. So I, I differ from a lot of what is called quote unquote mainstream science in that I think the climate change from human emissions of greenhouse gases is proceeding slower than its forecast from climate models. And I think if it proceeds slower, it gives us more time sort of to get our hands and arms around the issue. And um, I don't think we need to leap into action um, to try to stop something um, that A, I don't think we're going to have much luck on, and B, I don't think is going to be as big a problem as it's being sold to us. Well, one of the questions that somebody asked is, what should I tell my friends who think that human activity is the main cause of climate change uh, and not be seen as the crazy conspiracy theorist? And, of course, what he means by that is that the anybody who has even your view is accused of not just having a, an unorthodox view but of being anti-science. And if you're anti-science, that means you are against the consensus of all the responsible people. How do you – it must be extremely difficult to combat that. Well, it's a complex issue. Climate change is measured on many different scales, both temporally and spatially. So if you were to look at a huge spatial scale of the global average temperature, let's say, um, there's a stronger signal of anthropogenic climate change than there is on um, the local scale, and especially on local scale weather, like whether it was a blizzard or a flood or a tornado or a hurricane, those local scale phenomenon are still largely um, driven by natural climate variability. And it's in the literature, Tom. Um, so these folks don't need to think they're outside the literature. You only hear in the press about literature that supports the idea that global warming is causing all this bad things to happen. Or you hear people who get prayed in front of the press that say, well, such and such weather event is consistent with um, climate, anthropogenic climate change. But in fact, and, and what I do is spend a lot of my time delving into the scientific research and scientific press, um, and, or literature, I should say. And when you look in there, the, the picture is much, much more 
muddied than what is being presented in the mainstream press. All these things, all these major, these um, extreme weather events, A, it's very difficult to link them to climate change at all. And B, it's even unclear as to how climate change may impact those weather events. So you hear that, let's look at hurricanes. You hear that hurricanes are supposed to get worse because of climate change. Well, there's many aspects of hurricanes. Um, hurricanes are really only a problem if they hit land. So what you don't hear about is there's scientific research out there that says climate change might cause hurricanes in the Atlantic to stay out the sea and not hit land as often. And there might be fewer of them. And it's a whole realm of of climate and severe weather interactions that, it, and it's very unclear how climate change, anthropogenic climate change, interacts with that realm. And yet, when we do have these extreme weather events, there is never, ever anything approaching the kind of sober, scientific nuance that you might expect. We get the headlines telling us this is obviously a symptom of uh, global warming and climate change. Right. That's that's. I spend a lot of my time trying to push back against that sort of thing. You, I say, well, look, if climate change causes bad weather, climate change must cause good weather as well. And you never hear anyone say, boy, the weather is beautiful outside thanks to climate change. <laughs> no, you don't. You, you never hear that. But it's just as consistent with climate change as anything else you want to make up. Um, I don't push it too hard because it's not real strong evidence that climate change is making the weather better today. But it is overplayed in the press. Um, and, you know, it's the whole, if it bleeds, it leads. And so this is what people want to hear about. You know, we're causing natural disasters or <laughs> unnatural disasters, if you will, when in fact, it's much more subtle than that. But you just, they never, you never hear an opposing scientist get up there and say, well, the drought in California, it looks like was not really caused by climate change. It's in the literature, but it doesn't make it into the front page of the press. And if someone like me were to point out that that literature exists, then you have folks calling me um, science deniers, when in fact, I'm telling you what the science is. But that's just not how the press plays the game. I will leave the economic angle to Bob Murphy, who's been a co-author with you on, uh, it, on on some work that you've done. And on my show notes page for this episode, this is episode number 613. So tomwoods.com slash 613. I'll link to Bob talking about climate change. I want to stick to just the scientific stuff with you. We heard a lot about 2015 being the hottest year in history. Was there any truth to that? Yeah, it was the hottest year in recorded history, of thermometer history, going back to probably the late 1800s at the surface of the earth. Now, the question is what caused that to happen? Well, there was a big El Nino phenomenon out in the Pacific Ocean. And when you have strong El Ninos, the temperature spikes for a year or so. Um, there was a strong El Nino warm spike on top of a slowly evolving, a slowly warming climate. And when you put those things together, you got a record temperature. This is what we would expect to occur. But just because humans are causing the climate to change does not mean that we're causing the climate to change, A, in a particularly bad way, or B, that there's something that needs to be done about it immediately to try to halt that. Humans impact the environment all the time. I mean, look in the room you're sitting in, look out your window. So climate change is just another part of the way that humans are interacting and impacting their environment. But it doesn't mean we need to run out and immediately um, do something about it, especially if the things we're going to do about it um, quite possibly uh, is worse than the problem that climate change is going to present, or the challenge, I should say, that climate change is going to present. And I think uh, you and Bob have talked about the, econo the economics of it, and it's, it's unclear that the, eco the economics of climate change are, are, are for the negative. Um, and that's what we need to be careful about, because the response to trying to do something about it most likely will be a negative. Uh, tell me something about the pause, uh, this this uh, number of year period recently in which global warming appears to have paused, although I guess 2015 would have to be an exception to that then. I've, now, there are many excuses. Uh, I shouldn't probably use that word excuses. That's uncharitable. But there are many explanations, let's say, that the climate change crowd uh, has advanced to account for the pause. Uh, one of them being, and this is one of my uh, listener questions, the uh, that the uh, – you have ocean currents trapping heat reservoirs at the bottom of the ocean. What do you think of any of these attempted? Uh, first of all, tell us what the pause is. What do you think of these attempted uh, uh, attempts at explanation to try to explain it away? 
Sure. The pause was a period of 15 to 20 years where the Earth's temperature did not rise nearly as fast as it was being projected by the climate models. So this presented a problem to the climate models and the folks that want to enact policies on climate change based on the results of those climate models. All of a sudden, global warming wasn't happening near as fast as it was supposed to. So this sparked an interesting scientific inquiry as to why this was the case. Was it that the models were bad? Was it that the Earth actually is less sensitive to carbon dioxide emissions than the models presumed? Um, was it because natural variability was larger than, than was built into the climate models? And if, if so, what were these various causes of natural variability that was, that was causing this long period slowdown? Because during the past 15 years, during which time temperatures did not rise as quick as they were expected. It, it was, some people call it a pause because there was an extended period of time where the global average temperature did not show a statistically significant rise. Okay? Now, we can get down into the weeds as to the, 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 the importance of that, but to me, it's not, I don't expect that the global temperatures are not going to rise with a rise in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, so no one expected the pause to happen forever, and it's, they're showing signs that, it, that it's not happening anymore. But the significance was that the temperature was warming a lot less than everyone thought it was going to be. And so folks started opening scientific um, lines of inquiry into that and trying to explain what it was. And there's, as you alluded to, Tom, there's many dozens of excuses, if you will, to try to explain that, why the observations and the models diverged so much during the past um, decade or two. One of the solutions, you know, one of the things that someone put forth was the heat was being buried down into the deep oceans. Fine. Mm. That, to me, that would be a good sign. I would much rather bury down in the deep oceans than, you know, be up here on the surface um, affecting the weather. And the thing about it is, is you can bury a lot of heat in, in the deep oceans. It's the, the, heat, the heat capacity of water is very low and there's a lot of deep openings deep oceans. So the temperature change down there is on hundreds of degrees um, in the bottom of the oceans, virtually undetectable and doesn't have much of an impact, um, where if that same um, heat were allowed to escape, you know, be in the atmosphere in the land system, it might be a couple degrees of warming. So um, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think if climate models had a better handle on it, maybe they wouldn't project as much surface warming going forward. I am sure, I was going to ask if you had seen it, but I am sure, given what you do, that you saw that that just unbelievable exchange between Ted Cruz and the president of the Sierra Club. Did you see that? Was it recent? Oh, I don't know. It was probably about a year ago. And if you haven't, you are in for an absolute treat because the president of the Sierra Club was there and they were talking about – the way, I don't know, environmental regulation can affect minority communities. It was a rather obscure topic, mm -hmm. but they wound up talking about climate change and Ted Cruz mentioned the pause and he wanted to know what the the uh, president of the Sierra Club thought about the pause and his response was, well, we agree with the 97% of scientists who say that there's significant global warming and it's caused by human beings. And Cruz says, well, that's not even close to what I asked you. I, I'm talking about there is this period that shows no warming at all and I'm just curious to know what you think about it. And so the, the president of the Sierra Club was basically denying there was a pause and then when Cruz finally said to him, do you know what I even mean by the pause? The, the, the Sierra Club guy turns to, to his aides who then whisper in his ear that he does know what the pause is. So he came back and said, yes, I do. And he identified it as, as a period back in the 30s and 40s. Right. He had no idea what was going on. But what he kept on saying was, we agree with the 97% of scientists. Now, 97% of scientists wouldn't have disagreed with those observations by Cruz. They're just numbers. But that 97% figure gets thrown at you, must be thrown at you 10 times a day. What in the world are we supposed to do with that figure? Yeah, it's... Now that you tell me the story, I do remember the story. The, the president of Sierra Club really didn't know what Cruz was talking about. There's some recent data that suggests that maybe the pause is over, um, and and they're they're pointing back at Cruz as sort of misrepresenting what was going on, or or um, relying too much on one particular data set. And I sort of I agree with that sort of pushback that um, Cruz he he set up his 
reliance on the pause or discussion about the pause that was sort of out on a limb because the pause was going to give way at some point to me. So it wasn't that robust a line of argument. And then once it goes away, it allows him to be attacked. The robust line of argument is that a whole wealth of observations show that global warming is proceeding slower than expected. And therefore, we need to consider all that stuff before we consider um, what actions we want to take going forward. But as, as to that 97% number. It gets thrown around all the time. Even the president tweets about it. But the president and many of the others mischaracterize what that 97% is. Um, and so there's a whole lot of pushing and shoving about that number. I, it's, if you say that 97% of scientists, especially climate scientists, think that hum, agree that human impacts are affecting the large-scale climate, like I said at the beginning uh, of the podcast, I completely agree, and I'm comfortable with that's probably the case. But folks add on that says that, and they think this is very dangerous and we need to do something about it. And that is absolutely not the case. 97% of people, of scientists, don't think that. So it's falsely put out there to show that, A, we're doing something about the climate, we're, we're impacting the climate, and B, oh my gosh, we need to immediately um, stop doing that and mitigate our climate impact. And to me, the, the second part does not follow from the first. We're having an impact on the climate. Let's decide whether it's better just to adapt to that impact or whether it's steps to uh, mitigate it are worse than what we can expect to happen from the climate change. And I don't think we know the answer to that one. Um, we know that there's a whole lot of people in the world that don't have access to to electricity and their life would be much better if they had access to electricity. And so I think if that, act, if that electricity came from being produced from fossil fuels, it's still much better for them than the climate impact that might result from that. So we got to be very careful with how we attempt to deal, again, with the climate challenge. Um, personally, I think we can probably just adapt to um, the conditions that are, that, that are to come. Yeah, I want to get back to that before we uh, finish up. But there's a question here about sea levels. We always hear about the sea levels are going to rise and we're going to have to uh, accommodate ourselves to that. What can you tell us about what's really happening with the sea level question? Sure. I'm a climate scientist who's been studying the issue of climate change since the very beginning back in, in, in the mid-1980s. Out of all the things that are projected that might happen from climate change, the one that I keep the closest attention to is sea level rise, because all the rest of the stuff is just, you know, changes to extreme weather patterns and weather patterns that the climate change doesn't invent some mega cane, some storm that we've never seen before. You know, hurricanes exist in the existing climate and impact and, and hit the east coast of the United States and cause problems. So tornadoes exist. Uh, floods and droughts, all that sort of stuff. So it's just a matter of sort of dealing with um, changes in the character of those storms, which I think we can, we can do. What sea level rise, though, presents a problem in that we have a whole lot of infrastructure, both in the U.S. and across the world, that's built right on the coast, because a coast is a good place to um, build stuff. Um, and so if sea level rise were to be a rapid sea level rise were to be in the cards, that would be a problem. Now, so as I mentioned, I keep a good eye on this um, sea level rise literature because to me, um, you know, this is where the problem may in fact lie. My best um, assessment of the literature is that the sea level is rising as a result of climate change, but it's rising at a rate that we can probably deal with fairly readily. It's not that we won't have to adapt. It's not that we might have to build sea walls or other sort of um, structures to deal with it. But it's not going to be a six feet sea level rise in the next hundred years. It's more likely to be a foot and a half sea level rise in the next hundred years, which is about twice the sea level rise we saw during the 20th century. And we seem to have dealt with that pretty readily. I mean, we didn't even hear about sea level rise during the 20th century and having to deal with it. So it is an issue that bears watching. It's an issue that I think is, again, overplayed because in the press because they're trying to scare you into thinking a, 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 a large sea level rise is upon us just around the corner when it's not. You know, you always hear, you know, a third of Florida is going to be underwater by the end of the century. That's not going to be the case. Um, and, you know, taking steps to, to, to adapt to sea level rise, I would think 
um, for coastal communities should be in the coastal should be in the planning stages because sea level rise is going to occur. All right, but if sea level rise by the logic of everything is bound to happen if even if only very gradually, then playing devil's advocate here, couldn't the other side say to you, well, aren't you really saying that our catastrophe scenario of severe warming and major changes like sea levels, it, you know, they maybe for you, they occur 250 years from now. And for us, they occur in 80 years, but we're dealing with a catastrophic situation in either case. Well, again, we're going to have to adapt to changing conditions. We, we've done that throughout the history of, uh, of the human species. And, you know, we're, we're facing that again. We're going to adapt to changing conditions. The changing condition, I, I think, is going to be a, a sea level is going to gradually rise. And we're going to have to deal with that. I say I'm happy that it appears that sea level is rising at a relatively slow to moderate pace because I don't think, despite some people's best intentions, that we can really do anything about it. <laughs> um, fossil fuels are producing most of our energy, like 80% of the global energy supply, and it's going to be that way for years to come. And, and a lot of the warming that's going to come from that is um, some of it's already in the system, and, and there's more of it to come. So um, there's, from my standpoint, I think climate change is going to be modest, and I'm happy about that because I don't think that there's, there's things that we can do about it in, uh, in a very timely fashion. Um, I do not think that uh, trying to, well, I don't think mitigation scenarios where you, you, you severely strict, restrict carbon dioxide emissions are a viable thing to do because it robs people of you know, the energy that they need to live. And so um, there's no off the shelf technology that, that's going to fix the problem. Um, and so let's be glad that the problem is manageable because there's not a whole lot we could do about it anyway. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's theoretically possible we could simply abandon industrial civilization. But for most people who don't hate mankind, that would be a worse outcome. Absolutely. And I would rather adapt to climate change than, than to take Absolutely. an extreme, extreme measure like that. Let me ask you one more thing. Um, this is, a, again, a, a listener question. He said, I'd be curious about his take on the so-called medieval warming trend when it was warm enough in England to grow wine grapes. It's obviously much cooler than that today. So what does that tell us about the role of human beings in global warming? Warming. Yeah, there's natural variability happens on on all time scales from from you know weeks to months to to thousand to centuries thousands of years and you know obviously um, ice age intervals and you know geologic eons and sort of stuff like that. Um, that's not just because it was warmer in the past or colder in the past does not mean that humans are not having an impact currently. Um, there's an argument that says, well, since it was potentially warmer during the medieval warm period, that means that climate change um, that we're seeing now might in fact be natural. To me, that argument, it says that natural availability might be part of it, but also we know we're putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that's a greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gases act to trap um, heat in the lower portions of the uh, Earth's atmosphere and at the surface. So all, we should expect there to be a warming pressure from, <coughs> excuse me, um, increased concentrations of greenhouse gases. And so we are seeing that. So humans are having an impact. It's happening on top of natural variability. Um, it's interesting, Tom, though, that when I, I, don't, I haven't taken a recent climate change because I've been out of college for um, 30 years or so, but back then when you took climate classes, um, periods in the past that were warmer um, than current ones were, all, were always associated with good times and periods that were colder than, than average were always experienced, were always associated with bad times. So you had the, the medieval warm period and you had the Roman climate optimum. And then you had, you know, the plague in Europe and all that black death happened during the cold period. So, so cold is much worse for humans than, than, than warmth, than warmth is. Um, but, over the past, as, as the situation has evolved, people have tried to, uh, climate scientists, in fact, have trying to push back and not call it the medieval warm period anymore and not call it the climate optimum. They're trying to change the terminology that folks use, lest they uh, get apparently the wrong idea. 
Now, Chip, I want to put on uh, TomWoods.com slash 613 links to a couple of papers of yours, uh, The Case Against a Carbon Tax, which you wrote with Bob uh, Murphy and Patrick Michaels, and then uh, a paper you wrote just with Patrick Michaels, Climate Models and Climate Reality, A Closer Look at a Lukewarming World. Is there anything else you'd like me to put up there, any link to a site? Or I mean, I know you're with the Cato Institute. Do they yeah. have a part of the site that I can link to? Um, yeah, I mean, if you go to Cato... I don't have it open in front of me right here, Tom, but Cato, there's an experts page on Cato. And if you scroll down till you find me, you can um, get a link to all the various blog posts and, and working papers and policy analyses and, that we've done with Cato. Um, I also am the assistant director for the Cato Center for the Study of Science, and we have a web page on the Cato site and talks about all the works that Pat uh, Michaels and I have been doing along with Bob Murphy has helped us out from time to time. We have a lot of other good folks working for us doing a lot of not only climate change, but also um, looking at how the role of government funding of science impacts the direction and the course of science. And it's not always um, in the best way. And, and, and I, that's what the Center for the Study of Science is sort of looking into. Um, perhaps the best example of that is climate change, where you have such an overwhelming amount of government um, funding of the science that it really directs the scientific results um, towards the direction that the government, the funding agent, wants it to go. So um, there's, there, we have lots of pretty neat resources there at Cato um, if, for folks that are interested in, in the science of climate change. I'm really interested, by the way, in that subject of government funding of science because, you know, there are people who will say, I can understand why you don't want the government – involved in, let's say, price controls or rent control. And I can understand you don't want the government producing shoes. But for heaven's sake, the government has to be involved in science. So it's one of the hard questions. And then I read that book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research by Terence Keeley, yeah. that absolutely blew me away. I learned something new on every page. Unfortunately, I can't tr – I, I email him once. He writes back to me. And then I never hear from him again. I can't get him on the show. But I want to talk about that subject because it's so important. Tom, he's associated um – with, with Cato. He's an adjunct scholar at Cato, and he's um, associated with our center there. And I believe he's coming to the U.S. for a couple of months um, later this year. So maybe we can um, hook him up to come and you can spend some time with him. I appreciate that. I'm going to have to corner him one way or another because that's one of the books that I just – it just stunned me. It just completely – I already kind of – my instincts were in that direction, but then I, I actually felt intellectually fulfilled holding yeah, that view. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, Chip, I appreciate your time and your, your excellent answers and all the great work you're doing. Thanks so much. Sure, Tom. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. Big announcement for Friday's episode. Tomorrow's episode's a bit uh, up in the air. And when I say Friday, of course, I'm talking about episode 615 if you're going by – episode number. But before I get to that, remember, do please sign up for the webinar that the wonderful Sarah Young is putting on for you guys, for people who listen to the show. Remember, she is the guest I had on episode 610, who figuring, doggone it, I'm not going to leave my seven children to go out and work. I'm going to figure out a way to work from home. Well, she became a master of affiliate marketing. She would sell things that she knew about, like baby strollers and items related to parenting and then just built a whole business around this, and she's going to teach you what she knows. So join us for that. It's March 15th, but you got to register for it at tomwoods.com slash Sarah, S-A-R-A. This is 2016, March 15th. It's going to be a lot of fun, and as you know from that episode, she's wonderful to listen to, and we're going to learn an awful lot. Friday's episode is Ron Paul. We haven't talked to Dr. Paul in quite a while, and we got him back for Friday's episode. Tomorrow, as I say, I, I think, you know what? I'm not entirely sure. It's going to be a surprise episode. But Friday's no surprise, Ron Paul. So make sure you stick around. Don't miss Friday's episode. What fun that is going to be. Thanks for listening, everybody. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.